Our today's topic of discussion is diagnostic testing for dry eye disease. History. A thorough history is essential in the workup of dry eye symptoms due to the frequent lack of correlation between symptoms and exam findings. Examination should include evaluation of the face and eyelids, blinking patterns, eyelid margins, eyelashes, conjunctiva, cornea, and tear film. 1. Corneal sensation. Corneal hyperesthesia and or reduced sensation may be present in severe and chronic dry eye disease. Sensory denervation may cause dry eye by reducing the afferent signaling of tear production, reducing the blink rate, and by altering trigeminal nerve influences on ocular epithelial health. Decreased corneal sensation can also result from chronic dry eye. Corneal sensation can be measured using a cotton tip applicator or more precisely with a cachet bonnet esthesiometer. 2. Tear Breakup Time TBUT. TBUT is an indication of tear film stability. The proper method of TBUT testing is using a fluorescein impregnated strip wet with non-preserved saline solution, benzylconium chloride can increase tear breakup speed. The dye is distributed by blinking, and the patient is then asked to stare straight ahead without blinking. The tear film is observed under the cobalt blue light of a slit lamp, and the time between the last blink and the appearance of the first dry spot or hole in the tear film is measured and equal to the TBUT. TBUT has been shown to be decreased in keratoconjunctivitis sicca, mucin deficiency, and meibomian gland disease. Normal subjects show variability in TBUT, although 10 seconds is the typical cutoff between normal and abnormal results and has been found to be relatively specific in screening patients for tear film instability. 3. Ocular surface staining. 3.1. Fluorescein sodium. Fluorescein dye is the most commonly used stain in ophthalmology. Areas in which the corneal or conjunctival surface epithelial cells are loose or desquamated will stain with fluorescein. Fluorescein dye should be instilled as described above. The degree of staining can be graded using various scales. 3.2 Rose Bengal. Rose Bengal is more sensitive for conjunctival staining, but also more difficult to visualize and less well tolerated compared to fluorescein. Rose Bengal stains devitalized epithelial cells that lack a healthy mucin coating. It is applied using a dye impregnated paper strip. Interpretation of staining is based on intensity and location using a grading scale described by Van Bijsterville. The nasal and temporal conjunctiva and the cornea are graded on a scale of 0 to 3 with a maximum possible score of 9. In aqueous tear deficiency, the interpalpebral conjunctiva is the most common location for rose Bengal staining. The severity of staining has been shown to correlate with the degree of aqueous deficiency, tear film instability, and reduced mucin production by conjunctival goblet and epithelial cells. 3.3 Lysamine Green Lysamine green has similar staining characteristics but is much better tolerated than Rose Bengal. Lysamine green is also available in dye impregnated paper strips. 4. Shermer Test the Schirmer test is performed by placing a paper test strip in the lateral third of the lower eyelid after drying the inferior fornix and then measuring the length of the moistened portion of the strip after 5 minutes. The Schirmer eye test is performed without anesthesia and, thus, measures reflex tearing. The Schirmer 2 test also lacks anesthesia but is done following nasal stimulation, which has been shown to be reduced more in Sjogren's syndrome compared to non-Sjogren's dry eye. Schirmer with anesthesia is also commonly performed and measures basal tear secretion. The Schirmer test is often criticized for its variability and poor reproducibility. It is most useful in the diagnosis of patients with severe aqueous deficiency, but is relatively insensitive for patients with mild dry eye. 5. Delayed tear clearance. Following fluorescein placement, the persistence of fluorescein in the tear film at various time points can be determined. 6. Tear Meniscus Height Meniscometry The tear meniscus height can be used to estimate tear volume. A tear meniscus height less than 0.25 mm is suggestive of dry eye. 7. MMP9 Stressed epithelial cells on the ocular surface can produce matrix metalloproteinases MMP. MMP9 has been shown to be elevated in the tears of patient with dry eye disease, and levels correlate with examination findings in patients with moderate to severe dry eye. The normal range of MMP9 levels in human tears is 3 to 40 nanograms per milliliter. 
MMP9 levels can be elevated in other inflammatory conditions, such as graft versus host disease, Stevens Johnson syndrome, and following corneal surgery. Inflama Dry Rapid Pathogen Screening Inc. Sarasota FL is a single-use, non-invasive, disposable test that detects MMP9 levels of 40 nanograms per milliliter or higher. The Inflama Dry test is performed prior to installation of anesthetic eye drops by dabbing the sample collector at multiple sites along the palpebral conjunctiva. The lid can be released every two to three dabs to allow blinking. This should be repeated six to eight times, after which the sampling fleece should rest against the conjunctiva for at least five seconds or until it is saturated with tears, indicated by a pink or glistening appearance. The sample collector is then snapped onto the test cassette and dipped into the buffer solution for activation. After 10 minutes, the test is read. One blue line and one red line indicate a positive test result, and the intensity of the red line is related to MMP9 concentration. One blue line only indicates a negative test result. The Inflama Dry test was shown to have a sensitivity of 85% and specificity of 94%. In another study by Sambersky et al. 10, the test was found to have a total positive and negative agreement of 81% and 98% respectively, with clinical assessment when OSDI was included in the definition of mild dry eye. When OSDI was excluded, the Inflama Dry demonstrated a positive and negative agreement with clinical assessment of 86% and 97% respectively. Studies have also demonstrated that elevated MMP9 levels correlate most with other dry eye tests in advanced disease and is likely a late sign that is rarely present in mild cases. 8. Tear Osmolarity Patients with dry eye disease have been found to have elevated tear film osmolarity TFO. Tear hyperosmolarity can induce tear film instability by modifying the interaction between tear film lipids and proteins, damaging the epithelial cell membranes, triggering inflammation, and stimulating corneal nerves. Tear osmolarity can be determined easily in the office using the Point of Care Tear Lab Osmolarity System Tear Lab, San Diego, California, which measures the osmolarity of a 50 nL tear sample. Normal values are considered to be 296 plus or minus 9.8 mOSM, L. Greater than 308 mOSM, L is considered to indicate at least mild dry eye and has been demonstrated to serve as an early indicator of ocular surface instability. The test is performed by placing the tip of the handheld device at the lateral tear meniscus and then docking the sampler into the reader. The device contains a gold-plated microchip that measures electrical impedance in the sample and displays the osmolarity measurement within seconds. TFO testing is indicated for use in conjunction with other signs and symptoms. Combination of TFO with at least one other dry eye test will enhance the sensitivity and specificity. Shargas et al., however, did not find a significant correlation between TFO and MMP9 levels or with any other clinical dry eye test. 9. Tear Film Interferometry Interferometry of the lipid layer of the tear film is a non-invasive method of grading tear film quality and estimating the thickness of the lipid layer, which have been shown to be abnormal in evaporative dry eye that is secondary to Mabomian gland dysfunction. The Lippy View Interferometer Tear Science Inc., Morrisville, NC, is a commercially available tool that can measure lipid layer thickness. 10. Show Test Traditionally, Sjogren's syndrome has been diagnosed using the detection of SSA anti -RO, and SSB anti -LA, autoantibodies in serum. Recently, additional autoantibodies were identified as diagnostic of Sjogren's syndrome. These include autoantibodies to salivary gland protein 1 SP1, carbonic anhydrase 6 CA6, and parotid secretory protein PSP. SP1, CA6, and PSP were found in 45% of patients who met clinical criteria for Sjogren's syndrome but tested negative for anti-RO and anti-LA. The novel autoantibodies may be present earlier in the disease course. In a study of patients with xerostomia and xerophthalmia for less than two years, 76% had autoantibodies to SP1 or CA6 compared to 31% who had anti-RO or anti-LA antibodies. 
Currently in clinical practice, SP1, CA6, and PSP autoantibody levels can be determined using a commercially available blood test called SHO, Bausch & Lomb, which also includes SSA, SSB, antinuclear antibody, ANA, and rheumatoid factor, RF, levels in its panel. The test can be administered in the office using a simple finger stick with a lancet. Once a large drop of blood appears, the five dotted circles on the test card are filled. The sample is then allowed to air dry for 30 minutes, after which it can be sealed in a plastic envelope with a desiccating package. The sample along with the patient information is then mailed in. Test results are typically available within one week.